so excited tonight to have Dr. Gail Jett and her friends, Dr. Melinda, Melinda Connor and her daughter, Dr. Caitlin Connor, all here to discuss the Oregon State licensing regulation that is a law that is currently under review to bring more licensing to the state of Oregon for alternative and complementary health providers. And I have been getting so many questions about this in our Bend Health Group, and I really just don't know enough about it. So I'm going to pass it off to the experts now, and they're going to tell us a little about it. And I have all of your questions that you guys have been giving me to ask at the end. So I'll send it off to you, Gail. Okay, thank you. Well, I'm, I'm glad that people have questions. We're, we're going to give you some background on why we're doing what we're doing because we feel very strongly that energy healing practitioners of all kinds should be regulated by energy healing practitioners of all kinds and not someone who knows nothing about what we all do. Amen so, to that. <laughs> um, I, I, a little, a, Tiny bit of background on myself. I am a licensed massage therapist here in Oregon, a board certified nurse practitioner as well, and an advanced practitioner of Eden Energy Medicine. Um, and I feel very strongly about um, having the right kind of people helping to direct uh, my, my own practice. So um, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Melinda Connor, and she's gonna give you some history on all of this and you know why we're doing what we're doing. So. so the organizations that ended up being developed were actually started um, at the request of the Obama administration. Professor Sally Ann Payton, who was part of the team that wrote Obamacare, um, was a professor of law at University of Michigan. She was the token Republican on that group to, to write that legislation. And she was a complementary medicine user. And so she actually is the person who wrote the different sections related to complementary medicine into that bill. At President Obama's request, she came to the International Society for the Study of Subtle Energies and Energy Medicine Conference in 2010. And Dr. James Oshman brought her to that conference to meet with the board of directors to share President Obama's message, which was please organize yourselves. You've become a big enough industry that there are starting to be problems around the country. We really need you to step up to the plate, take responsibility for yourselves and organize yourselves. So we met with Professor Payton in 2010. She came back again in 2011 and said, okay, are you guys ready to go? And we all kind of went, ah, you know, <laughs> and panicked because asking energy practitioners to organize is a little bit like trying to stop water from flowing. Um, or hurting cats. Or hurting yeah. cats. Yeah. All of the above. <laughs> it's a pretty <laughs> complex process because we're, very complex people doing very complex work. And um, at that point, I was lucky enough to become friends with Professor Payton. We actually did a number of years of research together. And little did I know it that I got put in as the point person for the government to dialogue with because Professor Payton was retiring, a well-earned retirement. And um, so in February of 2017, I got a phone call from a person from Health and Human Services. Um, President Trump had taken office and they said, OK, so we're ready to go forward with laws if you guys are not. Now, that was kind of um, earth shattering to me. So um, I ended up negotiating a reprieve. They were very collegial with us, very supportive. 
and agreed to the reprieve we had until uh, February 2nd of 2021 to get some sort of licensing bill in somewhere. And so um, I went to a good friend of mine, blessings on her, and she agreed to fund the process of a series of meetings at Arizona State. And Dr. Robert Gilbert also facilitated that process. He's part of the radiesthesia and dowsing communities, um, also does research on the energies and was very supportive of the process. We ended up doing two large meetings at the at Arizona State University in Phoenix, Arizona, and bringing in leaders of many, many segments of the community, energy psychology, um, different forms of energy healing, medical Qigong, shamanism, Reiki, you know, lots and lots and lots of different flavors of energy work, spirituality. We had a number of reverends that were present um, that were coming together to see, you know, what can we do? How can we organize what needs to get done? The result of those meetings was 14 working groups. And those 14 working groups then ended up forming the National Alliance of Energy Practitioners, which is training programs from all over the country. It is not individual practitioners, it's training programs that are in alliance to move our industry forward and do education and information about our industry. And then we formed the National Certification Center of Energy Practitioners, working in a similar way to the acupuncture community. And uh, we then formed a set of divisions. We had leaders of 11 different parts of the community come together, discuss standards that were appropriate for their divisions, and uh, to really build a comprehensive base for the community to go forward. And so um, Dr. Caitlin Connor, who's here today, and Dr. Gail Jett, who's here today, are both members of the Certification Center Board, and I'm a member of the Alliance Board. And uh, what we've done, you can go out to the websites and actually look. It's www.naoep.org or www.nccoep.org. And out on the certification center, you can go to the division application section. You can see the various divisions. We have um, cognitive somatic, which is the lay form of energy psychology. We have um, shamanism, we have spirituality, we have Qigong, we have Tai Chi, we have various versions of Reiki, we have radiesthesia. We have natural healers for those who've had a spontaneous opening and, and really don't define themselves one way or the other. So we've got lots of different options, medical intuition, lots of different options for people where they're centering their experience of the energy work which they're providing to the community. And you can look at what people came up with. And uh, we have... Uh, different applications for each division. So shamanism asks for different processes and information than medical Qigong, the clinical Qigong aspects. Um, and just for the record, on Qigong, we are not talking about Qigong in the park. We are talking about Qigong in a hospital or a clinic setting, uses emitted Qi, or Tai Chi done, for example, on a cancer study. That's the kind of um, Qigong we're talking about licensing. We're not talking about the folks who are doing it because they love it and it's amazing for their own health and their own purposes in the park. Um, and we're not talking about indigenous practitioners either. Indigenous practitioners are covered under federal law. So uh, there's no, um, we have no right to dictate to indigenous practitioners. They have their own community of practitioners and their own definitions. It's a beautiful, beautiful community. I invite you to 
go look and read and see. Um, so there are many different segments of the population um, here in the US that are doing work and looking at things. And read up. Out on the NAOEP website, we do not charge for training programs to become members of the organization. We actually have a bibliography of over 15,000 research studies. We actually have a full master's level training program in research that's available free to the public for clinicians that would like to do research. And we're getting ready to be doing a um, conference, we hope, if everything goes well in the fall. And we're going to be adding a journal, a scientific journal that will be available to reporters and researchers and scientists and politicians and practitioners uh, in the future. And it's the International Journal of Healing and Caring, um, which actually has been around for 20 years. We're doing a collaborative agreement, which we're very excited about. So. There's lots of opportunities that are out there to participate. We invite you to participate in state organizations. We invite you to be involved, give feedback, dialogue with us. Um, if you're interested in being on a division board in the future, please let us know. If you're interested in helping us with ethics exams and standards of practice exams, if you're interested in teaching in your state, for example, an anatomy and physiology class or an ethics class, we'd be delighted to hear that information and let everyone know. Okay? So that's my part. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds wonderful. And now, um, just to clarify, are you on? So, are you on the board that is helping with the licensing in Oregon? I didn't. Um, I'm. Uh, I am an advisor peripherally to that. Okay. Um, but no, I'm the chair of the alliance, which is the training program. Okay. And that is uh, also giving advice. Is advising the legislation that's happening. Yeah, the, we wanted input from the training programs around the country. What are their needs? And so I will periodically get to go to certification center meeting and say, okay, this is feedback people. Yes. <laughs> so, okay, wonderful. I, well, I'll give you lots of good questions you can bring to your next meeting. <laughs> Thank you. I, so Terry, I think I want to jump in here and, and answer a question that I I already know is out there for people. So the important thing to remember with Oregon right now is we don't have a licensing bill yet. Yes. Okay. But what we did have that many people are aware of, and thanks to everyone who stepped up to the plate because they tried to slide in House Bill, as we know, 2493, which for folks who may not know, I'll just give you the nutshell version. The nutshell version was they were going to they were going to establish a medical freedom slash safe harbor act, and we'll talk about that too. What that what that means because there's a lot of confusion about that, you know, about whether it protects practitioners. But anyway, this particular bill started out they were going to establish a voluntary registry system. Part of it would be that you would pay your fee, okay. Um, and you would you would fill out a disclosure about your business, your practice. You know what what's your background, what's your training, and that kind of thing. And one of the big issues that I did not find in the bill, and I'm not saying that that I I know everything about it, but I went through it pretty carefully. Um, there's no oversight that you know you could say you had all these degrees or you had all this training or whatever, but there's no way to co to go and check that, right? So it's it sounded more like it's on the honor system but the problem that i saw with that bill too and i think a lot of people did was then it moves along and said it, it changed a little bit and then they started talking using the word licensing so we went from a voluntary registry to an agency that was going to be performing licensing what i found problematic about that is you know it because I'll say something about boards here in a minute, but the problem with that is they were going to, the Oregon Health Authority would establish an agency and appoint a director and there's who, who would oversee this agency 
that's overseeing reg the registry slash licensing. So it was a little concerning to see the verbiage change like that. Yes. The other problem that I saw is that we don't know what this person's background was going to be. And I'm not comfortable having a person come in and tell me, or, or it, I think any of the energy community, who know, someone who knows nothing about what we do. And so, for example, you know, we have the, the board of massage therapy in Oregon made up of massage therapists who understand what massage therapy is all about. And the board of nursing, the board of medicine, the board of acupuncture, what we have, have attempted to do with putting these things together is base our, our uh, you know, the regulations that we're trying to put in place to protect all of us based on a similar model, just as, as Melinda mentioned, you know, we used acupuncture as, as, as a model and these boards end up having, you know, they're made up of people who do the, the work that we're talking about, whether it's medicine, nursing, acupuncture, massage, but they also have similar things in common like standards of practice, right? an ethics requirement, um, a, a portion of certain anatomy and physiology, um, and it possibly a you know, continuing education requirement. I know nursing and, and uh, medicine and massage all have that. And I think acupuncture does too. So I hope yes. that helps to clear things up because it was made pretty clear as Melinda was saying that you know, if we didn't get our stuff together and regulate ourselves, they're going to come in and do it mm -hmm. for us. And it would probably mean forcing everyone to get a massage license, which is what they tried to do in the state of Massachusetts, because that's one of the first ones that we've been working with. Um, and the, the, pro, the, pro, the bill, fortunately, was poorly written and it died in committee. But House Bill 2493, as of 4.30 today, still has nothing going on. And it was referred to the Behavioral Health Committee um, because we had, I think it was close to 400 pieces of written testimony, thanks to all the energy folks, okay? And we had, I think it was close to 70 people signed up to speak and they, they were overwhelmed with the amount of information. So what, the, what are, we're gonna have to do in Oregon is keep a very close eye on, because this is not gonna go away they've made it very clear and we're going to explain what happened in California too. Um, but the other thing where, where we could use some help is if people, you know, the energy community in Oregon, if you're familiar with our legislative representatives, our senators and our house representatives as to who might be um, open to learning more about what we do, because this is a way that if you get someone who understands that, that can be a helpful way to get a bill um, passed, if that makes sense. I have sense. to say that I, uh, I reached out to several city council senators, I mean, the whole gamut, every representative in Bend, and said, hey, we're going to do this interview. And I'd also like to interview you guys, you know, just to be open and hear your side. Not a one of them even knew what this bill was. <laughs> every right. single one of them said, never heard of it. So that was interesting. I thought, oh, well, great. Our representatives aren't going to be much help because they've never even heard of this. <laughs> well, thank you for doing that, Terry. Um, and, but it is, it's all education. This whole mm -hmm. thing is education. And but it's like, who's passing a bill that nobody knows about? That's you know, scary. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so that's, that would be the thing that I would say that for folks who are interested, um, we need to identify, and I'm going to do some research. I've been you know, involved in some other things in this area. So I, I'm just, like I said, I'm going to start doing some, some checking um, and find out where, you know, where we might be able to get a foot in the door and start to talk about this and what it's about and why, because one of the things that I had said to them was we need a board as an interface between, you know, an agency director of some sort, but we need a board as an interface. Yes. And that's, that's, yeah, it, it helps to protect all of us. Absolutely. So yeah. there you, there you go. <laughs> so some information about Health Freedom Act, Safe Harbor Acts might be really useful at this point. Okay. 
Um, safe Harbor Health Freedom Acts are not the protection that energy practitioners think they are. The first thing is most Safe Harbor Health Freedom Acts are run by the Attorney General's office. And most Attorney Generals are pretty busy people and aren't doing energy healing work necessarily. <laughs> <laughs> so they don't necessarily know a whole lot about our profession. Um, that's piece one. And they're very, very, very busy people. And there's a lot of other things for them to focus on than energy practitioners. So that's kind of a problem. I'm not really yes. sure what the Health Freedom Act is. Can you just ex give like a uh, basic explanation? A, yeah, it's a Safe Harbor Act. It basically says I'm an alternative practitioner and I get to practice the way I want to. Okay. I have the right to provide services and somebody has the right to come and take services from me or um, hire services from me to do things. Okay. It, gives, it, it doesn't limit you to say, um, I'm, not, I'm not allowed to do Ayurveda. I'm not allowed to do chiropractic. I'm not allowed to do acupuncture. This says, any one of the modalities which is registered is allowed to practice in the state. Okay. Okay. So there are lots and lots of alternative modalities. There are thousands of them. And one of the interesting problems that happens with a lot of the safe harbor bills is, you know, politicians are, are normally working on roadways and bridges and school departments and budget allocations. And they may not know that there are thousands of different kinds of alternative practices and what those alternative practices encompass. Right. And so to ask them to decide if somebody is a good alternative practice or not, they're, they're not going to be able to do that. That's mm -hmm. not fair to them. So it, it is important that people do have access to a variety of, of care options and supportive care options. So the piece that the Health Freedom Act, Safe Harbor Act do very well is say, yes, you can go to ear candling or yes, you can go to Watsu or yes, you can have structural integration work done or yes, you can have Ayurveda done. Okay, they, that it does really well. But most safe harbor acts, when they put them in place, they don't realize the burden that it's going to be on the attorney general's office. The practitioners don't realize that the people who are about to tell them what they can and can't do don't know anything about their profession. And larger than that, if they get an advisory council, most of the folks involved don't realize you're talking about, even if you have just one representative, you're talking about a thousand people on the advisory council alone, okay, to cover the full range of alternative practices. So the single biggest problem after you get to, through all of those pieces is that Health Freedom Safe Harbor Acts are only good until a law is put in place. So I go out and a Health Freedom Act is regulation and a licensing bill is regulation. And as a health freedom person going and getting regulated, I'm going to um, go ahead and pay a regulatory fee. And as a person going and getting licensed, I'm going to go pay a regulatory licensing fee. Okay. And I won't have any say in the Health Freedom Act what laws apply to me. And in a licensing act, I can make a difference with that. And my committee, which is made up of my peers running the board of registry for our particular profession has a right to have a say in that particular process. So the control aspect is different. But then, with the Health Freedom Act, the minute you put a licensing bill in place, 
Health Freedom Act goes away for that profession. Mm -hmm. So you can have a thousand different alternative practices and you can have one pulled out and say, okay, we're doing licensing and it changes the day that bill goes into effect. Okay. So it's not the smooth sailing that people think it is. It's mm -hmm. still regulation. You're still paying money. Health freedom, you don't get any control over how your profession is run and it can be overturned. Licensing bill, you get control out over the profession and it takes actual Senate and Congress of the state voting on it to make the process go away. So it's a much more complex process once it's in place. Interesting. Okay, thank hey, you. More That's on good. that. Do you want to add, did I miss anything? I think, I think you got it. Okay. That yeah. makes more sense yeah. to me. All right. Terry, next question to all of us. Okay, should I start some questions? Sure. <laughs> okay, uh, let's see. Um, some people were confused about, is this a license to touch? And if they don't touch, say if they're doing some kind of energy work where they don't touch, would this um, not be required if, as long as you're not touching people? That was some confusion. Doesn't matter, you have to be licensed either way. So even Qigong, you're not really touching in Qigong. So either way, it would be. Um, yep. And Lisa from Ben Reiki asked, are all the modalities going to just be grouped together under one giant umbrella? So um, it depends how the law is written. We have 11 divisions and we actually have two different groupings within Reiki, classical Reiki and clinical Reiki and they have different requirements. Okay. Um, the clinical Reiki was in part developed by hospitals asking for us to have a slightly higher standard so that they could get reduced insurance rates, develop more Reiki departments, for example, in various hospitals, include Reiki practitioners in research studies, things like that. There was so, a lot of fear. I know this wasn't really a question, but I did hear a lot of fear that if this passes, like St. Charles will lose their Reiki program. And I don't understand why that would affect anything like that. And in fact, I think in some ways it would be better funded if it was licensed. Mm -hmm. And yeah. the hospital has to carry insurance on all those Reiki practitioners, even if they're volunteering. Yes. And this way, the hospital gets an insurance reduction because mm -hmm. all the practitioners have been appropriately licensed are carrying appropriate malpractice insurance are and the hospitals reducing their overhead and they now, can confirm that, was another that the question. practitioners somebody, are trained and somebody did ask if this would um, then require practitioners to have liability insurance yes and actually one of the things that we did because um you know medical liability insurance is so very expensive um the board that Kate and Gail are on went out and did a whole stack of research and and Kate maybe you want to address the liability insurance and where people can find information on it that would be great I she may be hung wait a second nope she's moving her head okay <laughs> sorry I was hung and now I'm not what's going on what was the question the, the question is, could you share about liability insurance for everybody? What's available and what's on the website? Oh, I don't, um, we have a couple of different options. I don't have all of them memorized anymore. Um, well, prices start at $129 a year. Yeah. Yes. That's really good. Yeah. Yeah, that's really important. Yeah, they go up to about 250 if you're an energy healing training program and training students. So that's comparable. So, I think massage is 230. So mm -hmm. that sounds comparable. Yes. Yeah. And it's not like a physician, which is 38,000 a year. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah. It's and, very affordable. And we aren't requiring that you get the insurance through specific pathways. So if you can right. find a place that's less expensive, that is perfectly okay. 
Wonderful. That's good. And we don't have any reciprocal agreements with the organizations that we've suggested on the website. We're not getting a kickback. Yeah, that's nice. We've suggested them because we vetted the organizations. As far as we know, they're credible. They do appropriate work. Their pricing is reasonable. Um, the anatomy and physiology class that we're suggesting that's out on the website is just one option. And we suggested it because it's used by the Biofeedback Association of America for uh, biofeedback practitioners and it's accepted at hospitals. So we accept community college anatomy and physiology. If you've had, you know, anatomy as a nurse or an acupuncturist, um, if you've had anatomy and physiology as part of your massage therapy training, um, if you've had anatomy and physiology as part of your Qigong training, uh, you know, that that's um, part of that process. And not every division requires anatomy and physiology. Spiritual practitioners uh, do not require that. Uh, shaman do not require that. So it'll be different licensing for different modalities, basically. So it won't Correct. be that everybody's lumped under one umbrella. It's very specific. So it's that's not one size all, fits all. And right. a group of your peers decided on what was the appropriate basis yeah. for wow. the process. It's almost and like we're going to need a thousand boards now. <laughs> <laughs> I think long term, maybe, you know, as, as alternative practices get used more and more. Mm -hmm. But certainly energy practices are big enough at this point. We also set it up so that each of the divisions does reevaluation of the requirements periodically, just as things are shifting over time. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's nice. And, and Terry, I'll just elaborate a little bit on the whole license to touch thing, because that's been a resurfacing thing here in Oregon for some time, as we know. I remember when I started my energy medicine practice that um, people were asked, well, the question came up about Reiki and you probably remember this too. And I actually talked to the massage board. I talked to their attorney and I said, you know, this is kind of a gray area. You know, do you have concerns about this? And she said, this is 10 years ago, but I don't think a whole lot's changed. What they had to say about Reiki and associated, you know, light touch, non-sustained type touch, okay, was that it, that was kind of the buzzword, as long as it's not sustained. With massage, it's sustained. I mean, we know that, but yeah. like with Reiki, we can do it in the field, okay, and we can do it hands-on as well. People do it both ways, and energy healing modalities, such as what we do with the Eden Energy Medicine, it's some it's in the field and sometimes it's just light touch holding acupressure points for short periods of time so i think people need to um understand that this is not and we don't have all the answers i mean we have really yeah. been working very hard on this but um right now it's not so much a license to touch it is more a license to practice Mm -hmm. I hope that makes sense. Oh, yeah, yeah. sure. Yeah, okay. I know that might... in some ways it, it kind of clears things up because I've been teaching Reiki for 23 years and my Reiki students always say, what do I need to do to start my practice? Do I need to get a license? And in Washington state, and I didn't really know Oregon as well, but I was from Washington, from Seattle. It was you were you could offer Reiki as a spiritual healer under the um ordained, you know, and we always say Reiki's not a religion, right. but <laughs> you could just go to ordainme.com and print up your $10. I'm a minister now. And then you could marry your friends and you could do Reiki. And it always felt really off to say, gosh, if you don't have a license to touch, if you're not a massage therapist or a nurse, you're going to have to become an ordained minister, like it or not. <laughs> so that's the only way to CYA, you know, to cover yourself. Um, and in some ways, I like this better because it gives a clearer, you know, now I can say, well, you can, it gives a legitimacy to Reiki practitioners and energy healers to right. have a license. And that really kind of brings me to this other question that um, somebody said, uh, 
wouldn't this make alternative practices seem more legitimate to people who haven't tried Qigong or yes. shamanism or Reiki? And uh, Judy Ann said she would be more likely to try some different alternative therapies if she felt people were licensed and insured. So I'm going to think there's that. I'm going to speak to that because this is one of my favorite areas. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm glad, she, I'm glad that she had that question because she's right. You know, one of the things people need to understand that those, you know, for those of us who have licenses, like in nursing and massage, for example, it's in a perfect world, we're going to have protection, complete protection all the way around with, you know, the consumer and the practitioner. But here's the analogy that I'm going to give. If it, because people, most people understand this because of conventional, you know, uh, healthcare, right? So let's just say that you need your knee replaced and you are, you talk to an orthopedic surgeon and you can feel comfortable. You, obviously, you're going to check and see who's good with knees, right? Okay. And, you know, this could be extrapolated to be the same thing with energy healers, but you, you can, you can, expect a certain level, a standard of care that is going to be similar with whoever you use, whether you get your knee replaced in California or you get it replaced in New York, that there's been a certain basic standard of care and standard training that you can feel comfortable about. And that's, you know, it helps to protect the consumer and it helps to protect the practitioner. So I, I like to use that analogy because most people can understand that. And, you know, it does give legitimacy to us in the energy healing the realm because it's more and more people are seeking out these alternative therapies because they work. They work. And the state is aware of that. And uh, we'll talk about California here in a minute too, but we'll, I'll let you go back. But does that help explain that yeah, a little bit? Absolutely. Okay. And that was another question talking about, you know, maybe we do want to go into California, but somebody said, don't other states have this kind of complimentary care licensing already? And people believe that New York, Washington, and California do, which was really funny because I could say for Washington, no, we don't. Right. And I don't think New York or California had until this week. <laughs> right, right so, until this week. Um, so what happened with California? I didn't get a chance to read everything you sent. Melinda, would you like to? <gasps> yeah. <laughs> so California is not a simple situation. And it's similar to what actually has gone on in the state of Florida with a new twist. So in the state of Florida, if you're an energy practitioner, you actually have to get a massage license to practice. You are not allowed to practice energy healing without doing 500 hours of massage therapy training. And I, it depends state by state what it costs, but we're talking somewhere between $8,000 and $12,000 to get that training. And, you know, ordinarily a Reiki practitioner is trained in several weekends and not trained 500 hours worth. So there's a significant difference in terms of cost. Yes. And it's a different process. Massage therapy is beautiful, but it's different than energy work. Can you combine them? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. You can combine them, but they are different. The purpose is different. So that, that's part of it. In California, back in 2002, they did one of these Safe Harbor Health Freedom Acts. And remember what I told you a little while ago, that the Safe Harbor Act is only good until a licensing bill is put in place. Well, during 2020, it kind of got skated under the radar <laughs> because it actually, the language in the massage bill didn't include the word Reiki didn't include the word energy healing, but the application of the bill, because at the same time they took out exemptions across the county and cities, that it had exemptions which took energy healing out of the 
um, massage therapy bills at the, the county and city levels and put them under health freedom. Well, the minute those exemptions got taken back out, whoop, you're now part of the massage bill unless you're separately licensed. Mm. So right now, our understanding is, and we're in dialogue with um, people in Sacramento County that went last week to get a Reiki license and practice Reiki in Sacramento County, and they were told that they must have 500 hours of massage therapy training to get a business license to practice Reiki. Uh And the representative that I spoke with today from the reflexology group, that's a legislative rep from the reflexology group, said that in dialogue, the um, attorney for the business office and the county clerk's office said that there would be a broad application to that parameter. It is not exclusive to Reiki practitioners. It's across the board for any energy healing practitioner. What we don't know is, is, is it going to also be applied to structural integration practitioners the way that it was in Massachusetts? So Massachusetts has had an exemption and they put a bill in to remove the exemption and it has not gone through like the Oregon bill has not gone through. And um, we're trying to get a licensing bill in Massachusetts as well. We're actually working in a number of states with a number of groups. We want to see energy healing made a profession. I don't care if you call it a spiritual practice or not. If you're taking money, you need to behave as a professional. And health freedom acts are registration just the same way licensing acts are registration. The difference is with a licensing act, you get a group of your peers making decisions how your profession is run versus the attorney general's office. The attorney general's office are very capable people. I don't mean to imply that they're not, but they're not generally energy practitioners in Mm -hmm. profession practice okay so it's it's a group of your peers or not and and there's one with that bill which is why i sent it to you uh terry you know if people are interested it i think it's the second page second or third page towards the top it just said applies to massage therapy and all forms of body work Mm -hmm. yeah and the interesting thing about this bill is if you read it, you can see that it's, it's clearly designed about, around human trafficking and, and, and sex trafficking. It's very, very specific if you read the, through the whole thing about massaging and what you can massage and what you can't massage and how you dress and all this kind of stuff. So it's, it's a bill that was broadly written because we know that human trafficking, sex trafficking is a huge problem. Oregon's second in the in the nation, Nevada being number one, um, and so there there's that whole whole piece of it, and that part I I agree with. But what California did as well is they established um, the bill esta- establishes a state board like we have here for massage or acupuncture or any of that, but they went from a county by county by county level to a state board with 13 members on it, only three of which are massage therapists. So that's what's gonna be you know, regulating this. And, and so that, that's what we know right now. And I, I think that it, it became painfully obvious <laughs> that the same thing could happen here and in other states because the government um, is, has made itself very clear that you know, it's not a matter of if, it's when. And they are giving us time to regulate ourselves, which is the way it should be. And hopefully people can all come together and and understand that we've been working really hard. We've still got bugs to work out. There's no question, Um, but we are willing to have input from people and suggestions and and that kind of thing. But, But we need to be getting serious about working on this together, so. Yeah, and that kind, of ties in, um, that kind of ties into another question just on that same, because you said in California, they said 
massage therapy and all other modalities. And so body work, body work. Yeah. And all other body work modalities. But then there's some things that are seem like, I mean, are they going to have a list of direct list? Cause there's like some gray areas, like um, people were asking, what about cryotherapy? What about laser therapy? What about body sculpting? I mean, there's a lot of people who do all kinds of things that aren't licensed currently that also seem like they maybe could require liability insurance and regulation. And, and then some people, you know, lots of things in the rumor mill right now, but some people are saying Oregon is really just seeking revenue. So they're going to go after every shop they can, every modality they can just to get some kind of licensing fees from no matter what you're doing, whether it's a laser or a body sculpting or, so I don't know, uh, how clear like how will you know that you need this licensing basically um is there going to be a list someday (laughs) when it ever passes our bill is specifically for energy practitioners okay so it wouldn't include body sculpting it wouldn't include laser work um for example um it doesn't necessarily include reflexology it doesn't include asian body work except the clinical application of the emitted chi in a healthcare setting. So it's, our bill is pretty limited and pretty precise. Um, And yes, they can regulate those things. And yes, that potential does exist. Mm -hmm. And yes, you could put in a safe Harbor act in the short term for that kind of process. And then as the public becomes more aware, has a better understanding, The practitioner has a duty of care. That means you need to have a business license. That means if you're working out of your home, you need to have a fire inspection. You need to have a health and safety inspection. You need to have a bathroom that's accessible if you're working out of your home. You know, some of the basic kinds of things like that because it's a duty of care as a practitioner. So, you do have that piece. And the fact that it's a spiritual healing or not a spiritual healing doesn't change that duty of care. Mm-hmm. You know, and actually Gail's an ordained pastor. I'm an ordained pastor. And um, both of us would say, actually, you know, you're doing a spiritual healing. You're called to a higher level. <laughs> <laughs> so. Yes. And I want to also distinguish something because this has come up as a question to the Alliance. Um, There was confusion about why a spiritual practitioner might need licensure. In many states, not every state, if a pastor is doing marriage and family counseling, the state also requires because they're being paid by someone who is not a member of their congregation um, for them to also have a marriage and family counseling license or a pastoral counseling certification. Many states require that. Not every state, but many states do. Again, it's part of this duty to care. So you're using the energy practices in a very specific way. You're using it as supportive care to the process. Now, you mentioned the Washington issue. You could go ahead and become ordained through a very simple process in Washington state. Well, you may want to go back and have some of your old students check because a lot of the states have overturned those laws because they've Mm. been abused and largely abused in the care of children. Uh So, for example, Massachusetts for many years had a protected act, Um, but it's been narrowed down in many states. So it's an individual who is ordained, who is working on a member of their congregation in a congregational setting. Mm -hmm. So if you're not offering services at least once a week, you're not doing pastoral work Mm -hmm. necessarily. And is this person a member of your congregation or not? Yeah. And and again, as a pastor, as a spiritual support, you want to be acting in integrity, you know, holding that place of truth and the connection to the divine, standing as a linkage and a translator, helping the individual connect to the right way for them 
to the divine. Yes. So it's appropriate to hold yourself to a good high standard. Mm -hmm. It was sort of the only way to lay hands on people. There was no other, you know, it was like, well, this you could do because there's nothing else, you know. <laughs> and for many years, that really has been the case because those laws were established originally back in the 1930s as part of um, the Christian science process, protecting yes. Christian science practitioners. Yeah. So um, yes, for many years, that's the only way you really could practice and be protected. That is not the case anymore. You really need to go out, check your state, see whether or not there are state laws that, that include that. Because for example, we talked to lots of practitioners in Massachusetts who didn't know those laws had been overturned in 1995. Wow, interesting. Um, another person had mentioned that doulas were not licensed until just recently in the state of Oregon. And um, they were forced to do licensing, but now it's been really good for them because they're covered by health insurance. And even now, Oregon Health Plan just this year is covering doulas in hospitals, which is amazing. Um, so people are wondering, could these modalities, alternative modalities be covered by insurance and even Oregon Health Plan potentially with this licensing? Yes. Melinda, you can speak We're to really that. We're really hoping. Yeah. Eric, yeah, go for it. No, I, 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 oh, go ahead, Terry. Um, Melinda, I think we had oh. talked about, the, I think it was you that I spoke with, and this is a while ago, but that part of this whole thing with getting the energy community licensed was that the insurance companies are interested in, um, you know, offering these things and covering these things. Um, that was kind of an in general um, understanding. Now, I, I don't think we've visited that in a while, but it makes sense yeah. That, that they, yeah, that they would. Back in 2010 and 11, we did dialogue with Fortune 100 CEOs. And if we are able to get practitioners licensed um, at an appropriate level in, you know, each state, which is 250 to 300 practitioners minimum for the population, um, they would prefer upwards of 600, but you know, at least two or 300 practitioners license. Um, then they can consider adding that particular discipline, and this goes for any of the alternative disciplines, um, to their own care plans because all of the Fortune 100s insure themselves for health insurance. And so the practitioners could then be added to the, the care plan. So we did some initial dialogues about that process. And there actually are CPT codes for energy healing, which exist. They are in place. So that once we do get insurance approval, the codes exist, you can build. Well, so far it all sounds great. What's the negative? <laughs> It's, you know, the, the only, go ahead, Melinda. The, the biggest negative is that you have to stay on top of the regulations. So you don't have regulatory creep, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. That's the, the biggest negative. Gail, how about you? Well, I, I think I'm going to answer for most people. You know, I'm used to being regulated because I have two licenses. So it's like, eh, you know, I, I, I get that part. And I can understand that there, were, there are going to be people unhappy with the fact that, you know, things have been going along, they have a good practice, they've got a good reputation, you know, people love coming to them, they're getting great results, and why do we have to have more regulation? And the only answer I have for that is that the government has made it clear that it is not if we regulate, get regulated, it is when, and this is why we took it upon ourselves to try to get measures in place. So, you know, again, using the existing boards for professions such as medicine, nursing, acupuncture, massage, et cetera, 
using those as models. And so uh, we, you know, I think people need to spend a little bit of time going and exploring on the NO, NAOIP website, because I think that explains a lot of things. But then even on the certification site, you know, you can plug in and see where you may, uh, where you may land, you know, what, what division you might be under, because we've got laying on of hands, we've got um, full spectrum. I mean, we've got a number of different modalities. And I suspect that's going to bring up more questions for people. And at another date, you know, we can certainly field those questions. I, I would like people to feel that they can be a part of this process that, you know, we're not busy, you know, ramming this thing through, trust me, we, we are interested in all of, uh, we're interested in the energy healing community regulating the energy healing community, mm -hmm. not someone else. That's the goal. Yeah, mm -hmm. because like that. as far as I'm concerned, I have a, you have a massage license too, Terry. And, yeah. and I, there is no reason that you would need to get, and I'm comfortable saying this, there's no reason that you would need, you would have to get a massage therapy license to practice these various healing modalities. It's just, it's, it's overkill on steroids. Yes. It, re it really is, you know, and, and having to make people go through, you know, in California, I'm sure they're going to get pushback on this. And I don't know what that's going to look like. And that one sentence that says all forms of body work. Well, <laughs> They're going to have to get specific about that. I mean, I, I think they're going to they're going to have some flack over this, but and, and you know, time to open a massage school in California, <laughs> right, right? But of course, that that's going to be um, you know they're going to have all kinds of regulations about the training programs too, because one of the things that people may not be aware of in California is that I think they have what fifty eight counties, mm -hmm. and the counties, and actually sometimes it's the city that sets the regulatory statutes for the practice of massage there. So you may only need a hundred hours of massage in, you know, uh, Ventura County, and you might need 500 hours in San Diego County. And so it's going to affect those LMTs that are already licensed in their various communities. Some of them may have to go back and get more, more training. So this, this whole thing is, you know, it, it's an, an example of what we don't want happening here, mm -hmm. as far as I'm concerned. You know? And this won't affect people who already have a license to touch or a license to nurse. They're not going to need this at all. No, this is this is for the folks because, fortunately, um, you know, energy modal healing modalities are within the scope of practice of nursing. Okay. Mm -hmm. And if you have a massage license, well, you're already covered. You know, it's like, yeah. you no, know, you, you, that, that's a different animal. But it's for the folks that don't have the protection that a license can give. Yes, I know it's more regulation. I get that. I totally understand that. But, but there's also some protection. And I think Melinda did a really good job of explaining the difference between safe harbor. Yeah. It gives the illusion of protection until a <laughs> law goes through which negates the whole thing. And then yeah. there you are. And, you know, these poor folks in California, our understanding is they didn't even know this had gone through, you know, so. Wow. As, right. And it, got, and it went through in January. Yes. And it's just coming to light here in July. Well, because people are trying to go get licensed and they're being told, oh yeah, guess what? You need 500 hours massage and a certificate to prove that. And you're going to have to take this big exam and you know, have liability insurance. I don't have a problem with the liability insurance. It, that it's cheap, yeah. Especially compared to medicine and nursing. But um, it it's just, you know, I feel for these folks who have established practices, and then now all of a sudden, oh yeah, guess what? Mm -hmm. You know, with no no warning. Yes. So it's not clear whether or not the counties are going to void the existing business licenses for those yeah. practitioners who've been practicing under the Health Freedom Act. Right. Or maybe when they go to renew them. It kind of reminds me of uh, what's going on with Venmo now. I don't know if you've heard, but Venmo is really cracking down on people doing business and just pay me for that chakra healing with your Venmo card. 
And the government really feels that people have been double dipping this year, doing unemployment, but then doing their businesses on Venmo because Venmo <laughs> is not a uh, tax 1099. So I would not use Venmo. I've been telling everybody who's a practitioner, a lot of times my massage clients say, can I just Venmo you? And the answer is, hell no. <laughs> I'm not taking Venmo. It's a big red flag right now. I mean, if you want the IRS on your front porch, you go ahead and do your practice on Venmo. It's kind of scary. Maybe just yeah. use it for babysitters. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> The other thing that's bringing people to government attention, particularly the Federal Trade Commission and the Federal Communications Commission, is if you were use the word not energy healing, but you say energy medicine, because mm. the information is that you're practicing medicine without a license. Uh oh, that's a oh, major yeah. no no. Yeah. And the next thing, people are starting to be prosecuted in a very interesting way. Banks are pulling their permission for clients to process their credit cards on websites if you have testimonials on your website and you are not a physician about medical care that uh -oh. or medical resolutions that have been provided. Mm -hmm. So you need to go out, you need to take those testimonies off of your website. How many people have Reiki's healed my cancer on their website? So something like that could get you in big trouble now. Yeah, exactly. And it'll actually oh, get the to bank know. to close your accounts. Mm -hmm. Wow. <laughs> Scary. <laughs> They're coming for us all. <laughs> <laughs> They're asking us to be responsible. Yeah. Right. You know? right. Exactly. Yeah. And That's... there's nothing wrong with being responsible. Not mm -hmm. at all. And professional. There's nothing yes. wrong with that. And I mean, these are, these are standards that, that raise frankly, the vibration of this profession. I think so too. No. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. The goal is not to lock anybody out. The goal right. is not to provide requirements that are onerous or burdensome. Right. The goal is to make sure that we act with integrity and we cherish our clients. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's both consumer protection, but it's also our own protection, because then we're behaving in integrity right. and we're holding the light of truth. That means the healing work that we're going to do is that much better mm -hmm. and it's that much more important. Right. We'll be able to support people more compassionately, more capably, more clearly. I right. love that. That's beautifully said. Well, I think I got all my answer, all my questions answered. I think that was it. Okay. Yeah. Well, Terry, thanks for putting this for together that. and and you know giving us a chance to share with the community. And certainly, there will probably be more questions that come up. And you know, again, we don't have all the answers. And you know, we're going to probably this is a work in progress. So um, you know, people Anyone are welcome. Who Anyone who reads through the, the websites, please feel free to send us feedback. There are- And I'll put a link to the website. Perfect. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Because- Our Phone numbers and- Oh, go ahead, Kate. Website. So um, there's contact information on all of the websites. So right. any feedback you want to send us, you can. Okay. Do. Yeah, definitely. Because, you know, we, we, absolutely are open to constructive criticism or construct you know good thoughtful questions or like have you guys considered this and that kind of thing you know this is this is new you know so like i said we're trying to base it as close as we can on existing models but there's still going to be you know room for growth and there's going to be gray areas and there's going to be questions so well i vote for you guys to be on the board they should put you on the board <laughs> Conflict of interest. On the board yeah, of that'd be a conflict healers. of interest. Right, right. <laughs> but they need somebody who has your kind of background, you know, that can. The bill actually asks for practitioners who have 10 years of practice. Yeah. To come forward to be on the board. On a board, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. Oh, that's yeah. good to know. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's very important that we have practitioners who have worked in the field long enough 
and truly are in professional practice mm-hmm. that they have an understanding of the interactions. They understand the complexity because very often the work that we do is blended boundary work. You know, mm-hmm. it may be somebody from the grocery store or somebody that, um, you know, is the kindergarten teacher of your kids or, you know, that kind of thing. So it can be a very blended boundary for an energy practitioner Mm -hmm. and having good solid experience and how to maintain integrity is very, very important in that process. Right. I think that um, so often there are these blurred lines with uh, different practices too. Like um, what drives me crazy, I do acutonics which I studied at Bastyr University. And I went through the acutonics.com, the people who really started the tuning fork craze, but you know, and I took four years of education to do that, but then people can just go on Amazon and order tuning forks. To me, that's mind boggling because they are really powerful. And you wouldn't just go on Amazon and say, hey, I think I'll just buy some acupuncture needles, give it a try, or, you know, (laughs) maybe I'll just, go buy a scalpel and see if I can cut someone open. I mean, you just wouldn't do that. But, and even with the cupping, so many people are doing cupping now that aren't properly trained and that is pretty intense. And I just, I think there could be some regulation that could really help um, just put some more honesty to what you are trained in and what you should be doing and not be doing. (laughs) And energy medicine is the same way. I hear energy medicine thrown around all the time but people haven't really studied it. They're just using the language that they, you know, might've picked up a book and it sounded good. (laughs) And and as opposed to like actually going through Eden energy or taking some traditional energy medicine program, even hands of light, you know, a lot of people pick up hands of light. They read the book and now they're an energy medicine practitioner. It's like, (laughs) well, maybe we worked with her when I was at the massage school in Brennecke and she has a whole certification program. Yes, she does. You don't just read the book and call yourself what she does. (laughs) No, no. (laughs) It's still out there. It's a four-year training program. Yes. I love her work. I took coursework with her. I didn't get certified, but I love her. So I don't know, I I call that in Reiki, we call it flaky Reiki, you know, (laughs) when people have no training and they, they watched a YouTube video and now they're a Reiki master. (laughs) Yeah, we've, we've found a place that's doing distance attunements on people that watch two hours of video and then send them a certificate as a Reiki master. Oh my gosh, that's so, so sad. That's uh, so They're missing out on some of the best parts of the learning. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that you do as an energy practitioner, if you're going through this national certification process, is you're committing to your craft. This is a learning process. You know, so all four of us are practitioners. All four of us have been practitioners for years and years and years. I think we would all agree. and, And I can, you know, I'd love to hear from you. Did you keep learning? Absolutely. Yes. Yes. Okay. So I did, I did a six years to become a Reiki master and a year of it was doing Reiki attunements on people every day, like learning how to dance, you know, where you learn how to do the attunement, then you bring in the energy and then you forget how to do the attunement. (laughs) It's like, it takes a, it took me a year to master how to give a proper attunement and there's no way you could learn that, you know? Yeah. That is completely it's an art. Reiki. It's an art. It There's is. a $16 program out on the internet now for Reiki. And, and you know, price tag is relevant and not relevant. But what you want is good quality training. This is a sacred work of art that's on your table. Mm-hmm. This person, mm-hmm. if it's an animal, the animal. If it's a plant, the plant. This is a sacred work of art. It needs to be, you need to be acting in integrity and in compassion and holding that factor. I mean, if you're, you know, maybe you're reweaving a spinal cord or something like that, but you should still be holding that piece as that connection to truth and compassion. Mm hmm. Oh, man, I agree. A woman. Well, thank, thank you, you all so much for sharing your wisdom. I You're feel like welcome. I have a better handle and it 
Doesn't seem too scary unless they just slip something crazy right under us. Well, we're going to try to keep an eye it, for my understanding, and I'm no no pro. I've had to get up to speed quick, pretty quickly. Um, but our legislative session, I was going to be over Monday, but I think they all kind of wanted it done today. So we will be on a six month um, hiatus until we go back, at least here in Oregon, until we go back into session in January. To me, what the energy community needs to do is, again, if we start, re and you know, the more we reach out, I think, to our representatives and city council, and you know, you and I can talk about that. Even but, informing them that it exists. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And then explaining, you know, what it what it all might means. And like you said, you know, taking the woo factor out of it and it putting in the education factor and identifying people then in Salem who may be willing to, because we've got a bill ready to go that yeah. if they understand the importance behind what it is, the work that we're doing, um, we just, again, we just need to identify those people. And I'm sure there are folks listening now or, you know, who will be listening and then more who can say, you well, yeah, you know, I know that representative so-and-so is open to this, you know, and that, that's where we're going to need the community to help us. Yes. So that would be one thing I would just put out anybody who, you know, has knowledge of senators or or representatives that have possibly some interest in this those are the folks we need to start talking to and okay. we got six and months petitions in support of the bill it, as right. well right yes. there's another piece yes talking to um the board of professional licensure the bo board of consumer protection so that they're aware of what you're trying to do that you are trying to protect the consumers you are trying to make sure that you have educated and competent practitioners. Right. Again, we're not trying to lock people out. The goal is to have capable people doing good quality work. That right. sounds wonderful. Yeah. Yeah, I like it. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. And I will link uh, your contact information and your website. I'll get that from you, Gail. Maybe you could just email me that whatever emails and websites you want Right. If we'll we'll give you the yeah the NAOEP and the N, uh, NCCOEP also. I'll okay. get that sent to you. We'll yeah. just link those with the video, and yeah. then people can learn more about it too. Exactly. Exactly. And feel and like I said, they feel free to shoot questions at us. You know that kind of thing because again, I'm sure wanna... I'll get even more questions. Even oh, though. probably, <laughs> probably right. <laughs> okay. Thanks so much for answering all these questions and taking the time. Yo, you're very welcome. Thank you. Have a okay. beautiful evening. You yeah. too. Nice to meet you all. Okay. <laughs> Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>